This podcast, brought to you by Anchor, is currently non-profit making and is based on the second edition course book on international history from 1870 to 1945 for Cambridge International AS Level History. In this episode, I'll be discussing the policy of appeasement that was followed by Britain and France, including German rearmament and remilitarization of the Rhineland. Let's begin with the use of the policy of appeasement during German rearmament. In 1933, Hitler walked out of the World Disarmament Conference and quit the League of Nations as he faced opposition from leading countries in the League and at the conference. He had blamed France for the failure of disarmament, claiming that he could not leave his borders defenceless when France refused to compromise and react by reducing their armaments. After Hitler's withdrawal from the World Disarmament Conference, it was clear that he aimed to rearm Germany against the Treaty of Versailles terms. Germany began openly rearming in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, which restricted German armed forces to only 100,000 men in the army, no submarines or aeroplanes, and only six battleships. Hitler developed large and well-equipped armed forces. The armed forces were able to gain experience from the Spanish Civil War. For example, the Luftwaffe was able to practice blitzkrieg tactics which were important to their war effort in the United Kingdom. By doing so, he restored the pride and prestige that Germany had in their military, and Germany regained its status as one of the world's most powerful nations. Britain responded by signing the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. It was a bilateral agreement made between two parties without the consultation of others. In June 1935, only two months after the Strisse Front was established, Britain and Germany signed the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, in which Germany was allowed to increase its navy to a maximum of one-third of the British navy. This was done without consulting Italy or France. While this guaranteed that Britain would have a superior navy, Britain was allowing Germany to break a term of the Treaty of Versailles, which had severely limited the German navy. Britain's opposition to German rearmament had been effectively removed. Therefore, Hitler felt free to continue to increase the size of his army. He ordered the construction of new battleships and began to develop a large and efficient air force. Hitler claimed that the Anglo-German naval agreement was necessary to protect Germany and Britain was understanding Germany's security needs. However, Britain indirectly benefited from rearmament as they were close trading partners. What are some of the reasons why Britain and France did not take any action when Hitler defied the Treaty of Versailles? In the case of France, they were in the middle of a general election as their country was on the verge of collapse and would not act without Britain's support. Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary at the time, had met with the German ambassador and made his proposals. However, when Hitler refused to withdraw his troops, the British government did nothing as the British people felt the Treaty of Versailles was too harsh. Moreover, British politicians believed that a strong Germany would be a good defence against communism. Hitler was very persuasive and was able to convince other countries that his motives were peaceful and logical. Hitler justified his actions, for example, remilitarization of the Rhineland and rearmament by arguing that he was correcting the harsh terms of the unfair Treaty of Versailles and that Germany was simply defending itself and had the right to do so. This was accepted in Britain, as many people there believed the treaty was too harsh. Now I will take a look at the remilitarization of the Rhineland in 1936 and how appeasement was used. During the Paris Peace Conference, France insisted that the Rhineland should be a demilitarized zone, as France and Belgium had experienced invasion by Germany through this area in 1914. Upon signing the Locarno Treaties of 1925, Germany had agreed to maintain its status as a demilitarized area. As part of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany wasn't allowed to keep military forces in a 50km stretch of the Rhineland. Hitler despised this term, believing that it made Germany vulnerable to invasion. This is kind of ironic in a way, as the reason for it to be put in place was that France, who feared Germany, believed that a militarised Rhineland made themselves vulnerable to invasion from the Germans. So, how was the remilitarization of the Rhineland a risk for Hitler? Basically, Hitler took a huge gamble. Knowing the German army was totally unprepared for war, because really at this time the German army was totally unprepared for war, it was much smaller than the British and French armies, and would have been hopelessly outnumbered if the French or British had decided to confront him. Hitler had actually given his army the instructions to retreat at the first sign of resistance. 
Many of the German generals already disliked Hitler and he opposed his plan. So if the German army had been forced to withdraw, he would have faced public humiliation and would have lost the support of the German army and angered the German public. In March 1936, although Hitler took a massive risk by moving German troops into the demilitarized Rhineland area of Germany, although he justified the remilitarization by saying that the Franco-Soviet Treaty of 1935, the Treaty of Mutual Friendship and Support between France and the USSR, posed a serious border threat to Germany. It was made with the aim of reducing the threat of Nazi Germany from Central Europe. The Rhineland was important for German security, as it lay on Germany's border with France. Hitler's plans to expand eastwards meant that he needed to secure this border with France. Why was it successful? The gamble of remilitarization paid off for Hitler, who had timed the action well, as France was in the middle of a major financial crisis and was increasingly reliant on loans to avoid bankruptcy. Elections were also taking place in France at this time. Due to the lack of effective action in response to Germany's remilitarization of the Rhineland, it had exposed major weaknesses in the relationship between Britain and France and the growing distrust between them. Hitler believed that both Britain and France would do nothing to prevent his further attempts to undermine the Treaty of Versailles, such as reuniting with Austria and annexing them, and taking over Czechoslovakia after claiming the Sudetenland. Let's talk more about the British attitude towards the situation. The League's inability to come to a decision due to Britain's fear of a war fueled Hitler to undermine more terms of the Treaty of Versailles. The remilitarization of the Rhineland was able to test Britain's response in the event of a violation to the Treaty of Versailles and the Locarno Treaty. However, Britain did nothing and claimed to have reasons for not wanting to take any military actions. Basically, the British could see little harm in German troops occupying German territory. A politician, Lord Lothian, claimed it was simply Germans walking into their own backyard, while socialist playwright George Bernard Shaw argued that it was no different from British occupying Portsmouth. To many British, Hitler's actions were justified as a response to the Franco-Soviet Treaty of 1935. Even before German troops entered the Rhineland, Britain had wanted to negotiate with Germany over its rights to remilitarize the area, as they saw this as an opportunity to develop more effective relations with Hitler's Germany. British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin argued that Britain itself was suffering from the Great Depression and lacked resources to enforce the treaty. British public opinion was strongly anti-war, as well as their overseas territories such as Canada and South Africa. The British politicians had little trust and respect for their French counterparts. All in all, the British government was convinced that the best way of dealing with Germany was negotiation and the policy of appeasement. This is the end of the podcast. Thank you for listening. Please consider using the links in the description below to leave a voice message for me, leave feedback for me, or visit my website which hosts additional revision material. Depending on which app you are listening to this on, you could also rate and review the podcast. Thank you.